Welcome to lecture four of LL536, Language in the Media, and this week we're looking at genre theory, or are we learning the text? So the first thing that we really need to establish when we're thinking about genre is actually the idea of schema and schema theory. So this is a theory that was established by the psychologist Frederick Bartlett back in the 1930s and he did a series of experiments, some research on um, people to find out how we remember things and um, he took groups of people and they were told uh, stories and then uh, sometime afterwards they were asked to repeat the story um, and he looked at um, how this repetition and um, how they retold things um, and then was able to work out how or a theory of how we actually store our memories. So as it says here on, on the slide, um, what Bartlett came up with um, is the idea that memories are not stored as static traces. So it's not that we have a section in our brain that remembers um, all the books that we read, or there's a section in our brain that remembers um, beards or the weather, or uh, colours, or, or whatever. It doesn't really work like that. Instead, Bartlett uh, believed and theorised that we have actually um, a sort of a, a complex system or um, a form of remembering things that are referred to as schematas or schema. So the way that this works is that... Um, we are not necessarily completely blank pages when we're born, but rather a bit like if you when you buy uh, a brand new computer, um, you already have some you already have the hardware in place. So, you know, in a human being, the hardware would be the brain, um, our senses um, and then the the software, if you like. Um, which obviously gets more sophisticated. We get upgrades as we learn more. Um, but for babies, the software that they come, come with, pre-installed, if only they did, um, is actually very simple and straightforward. And um, it is more about the organisation. So um, babies are the ones who actually build schemata, the initial schemata. And uh, as we get older, so we simply add to the various schemas we already have and just update them. Um, so the way that it works with um, a baby is, for example, if they see a dog, uh, you know, the um, whoever is with them, whatever sort of adult caregiver will say to them, probably something like, look, the doggy or, or something like that. Um, and um, the child, the baby, the infant then sort of begins to uh, recognise this sound pattern um, of dog uh, and how it's um, connected to this creature. And although the baby may not be able to count that it has four legs, you know, there will still be this awareness that this particular creature that is not like them and is not like uh, their caregivers so it's not human but again obviously a baby's not going to be using that word um, but you know is not the same is so is other uh, but it has four legs it has um, it is furry uh, it makes that noise of a wolf it has a tail it likes walks it's friendly and, and so on and so forth so all of these different aspects of a dog will be the sort of the new schemata that the baby will begin to establish. And of course, you know, if um, if a baby never sees a dog but is introduced to cats, it will build the schemata for cats. And then perhaps if it sees a dog, it will perhaps either be 
um, possibly frightened because it doesn't really know what this bigger creature is, if it is bigger, or if it's similar in size to a cat, the, the baby, particularly once they start uh, to talk, might actually sort of point at it and, and you know, say cat. Um, so this is where we often have uh, children sort of um, mistakenly calling um, similar objects the same name. Um, and, you know, not, not just not just babies, you know, adults do this, too, with sort of far more complex objects. You know, if we're, we're not sort of quite sure what, um, and particularly in different languages as well, if we're not quite sure what something is, we might say, uh, so, for example, we might look at a sheep and we might think, oh, well, that sheep has horns. Therefore, it's not a sheep. It's a goat. Um, because we have a schemata that tells us that goats have horns and are small and like to bounce around and wag tails like a dog but you know not quite like a dog so if we see a um a a lamb that has horns we would be forgiven for saying oh that's a goat when in fact it's not uh, but you know there are sort of minor uh differences and and you know if, if we see a crocodile, we might call it an alligator, those types of things. And I realise I'm sticking with animals here, but, you know, they're, they're the easiest um, things that I can think of for the moment. Uh, but essentially this idea of, you know, we have a particular schemata, a model, a framework that we slot these different objects as we meet them in the world. And, um, you know, that then sort of gives us a map of, oh, this is what it's like to go in a car, for example. And, um, you know, if we uh, the first time we go on a bus, we might already have been on in a car. But, you know, again, as sort of a baby or a young child, when we go on a bus for the first time, we would use our schemata of going in a car or if we've been on any on any other type of public transport we would then use that schemata so you know we may not have been in an aeroplane but we've been on a coach perhaps or we've been on a train and so we might use some of the same schemata because then that allows us to anticipate what we're going to get and then we update our schema for that particular um thing that we're, we're doing that um, experience or that object and we can then label it as the new thing so going back to the baby with the dog they might see an African wild dog and assume that's the same as the furry friendly pet and yes genetically there are similarities uh, it's a wild dog but it's not quite the same as uh, Fido here with his ball so what are the implications here and why am I talking about this to do with genres? Well, as it says, this idea of schema theory, this can actually help us to understand how we make sense of texts and not just texts. Um, you know, texts by extension here, I'm taking to mean not just words on a page, not just print on a page or on a screen for that matter, but actually let's sort of expand that notion of text outwards. And it, this allows us then to cover um, all forms of literature. And that means, yes, that uh, that sort of covers text, print text of sort of novels or fiction broadly, um, it also allows us um, to let's extend it through with texts to non-fiction, so the press, the media, um, print media, but also let's extend this to things like poetry and also to forms of drama. And obviously forms of drama then allows us to take into account here films and television. Uh, you know, as well as sort of plays performed on a stage. So all of these different forms of media, if they are text based, uh, and as I say, that doesn't necessarily mean that what we actually experience is printed text on a page, could be watching a film, but, you know, it still at some point has been a text. Uh, we can use schema theory to begin to understand how we make sense of this and how we recognise what uh, genres are and how we categorise uh, different types of films or different types of TV programmes, different types of um, 
uh, written materials, so newspapers, novels, and you know, and genres within those. So schemata may be the psychological basis for our sense of promises and our horizon of expectations. So in other words, we have this idea, like if we're about to go on a plane for the first time, we've already been on a train, so we already have certain expectations. Or uh, perhaps more commonly, if, um, if you've never been on the Eurostar, but you've been on um, the high speed from Canterbury up to London. So you already know what uh, the high speed trains are like. Obviously, they go into the same station. They, you know, they both go into St Pancras, but they're not quite the same. Uh, but if you've been on some of the high speed trains um, that sort of go uh, up the country, particularly if you know sort of catch any of them that go up to the northeast or the northwest, so you know very and also up on into, into Scotland, you'll know that some of those trains are far more like um, the Eurostar train than the one that you catch from Canterbury to Ashford or Canterbury to Margate, you know. So again, um, you know, we have already encountered something similar and we will use that existing schema to that existing experience and we will then be prepared. We will have expectations of what this next experience is going to be. So that could be genre. And in fact, um, one of the people that writes about this notion of schema preser uh, preservation versus schema disruption. So, you know, things that uh, when we expect to pick up a murder mystery, for example, there are certain things that we expect. And when we don't get that, we have schema disruption. And, you know, what that does to the reader or, you know, the, the viewer. Um, the audience essentially. So uh, keeping it following exactly what we're expecting or whether it gets really changed, uh, you know, and that that has an awful lot of implications for audiences and also for uh, producers of these texts. So the, the reference there um, is to Peter Stockwell, um, and you can see it's 2002, but Peter Stockwell has written extensively on um, cognitive poetics and stylistics. So essentially how our brains organise all of this and how our brains understand the text, um, how uh, we perhaps perceive other people's minds uh, within texts. Um, and uh, we'll also, um, well, some of you may already have come across this if you did Tackling Text last year with Jeremy, but also this notion of um, how we move into texts, you know, when we have this notion of a deictic shift. So Peter Stockwell's written an awful lot about that as well. Um, and definitely his book on cognitive poetics is, is well worth a look at. OK, right, let's pause there because uh, that covers now the section on schema uh, and Bartlett, um, first and foremost, which, as I said, dates from the 30s. But, you know, is still uh, that notion of, of schema is, is ex extremely important and quite central to an awful lot of work on uh, cognitive stylistics. Um, and, you know, as I say, how we understand the text. Uh, and um, so Peter Stockwell is also somebody useful to look at, as is Guy Cook. Um, and, um, you know, these are, are in the, the reading list, but also if you just go and do on something like Google Scholar or a library search on schema, uh, these names will, will come up. So we'll pause it there. So take a break now or um, go and do a little bit of research about schema. And, um, and then we'll come back to the next video where we're going to look specifically at genre theory.